Okay, welcome back. So um, we're going to continue uh, with uh, lecture five, and I'm uh, going to finish lecture six. And, um, uh, talking to you in the past couple of days, I actually made some adjustment to lecture six so that uh, hopefully I also uh, make some of the things that you are interested in uh, a little more clear. So um, the, just a little bit more detail about the small bean uh, design. And if you look at, uh, if you Think about a uh, half an uh, angstrom lattice spacing, and uh, then designing a four angstrom cube. Um, the potential map is essential. Will give you uh, eight lattice points um, in each dimension. So that gives you eight times eight times eight potential map points. And this is 128, and that's a reasonable number of threads for you to you know to uh, to, to have. And um, uh, assuming that every thread will process four points, and this is, you know, well, that's thread coarsening. And you already have seen that, so I don't need to go into details, right? And, 30, and here you can get about 34% of the uh, efficiency. That is, 34% of the examined atoms are within cutoff distance. This is something that I really want you to remember. When you are dealing with parallel computing, there are going to be somewhere you may not have the highest efficiency. Okay, you may not be able to, you know, to, to always expect something like an 80% efficiency of your machine. In fact, the joke is that, um, you know, when we have these large MPI machines, and um, you know, usually you can tell whether a grad student is new or not new, right? The the you know veteran grad students. Was say you know when you say something like 10% utilization, the, the veteran grad student would just nod and say, oh, that's pretty good. And you know a, a brand new grad student would say, oh, that's terrible. You can only use 10% of your machine, right? So here, um, when uh, when you look at the uh, computational efficiency, um, this 34% is not stellar, but it's actually quite tolerable. And if you um, if you want to tune up this uh, frequency, uh, this efficiency, oftentimes you need to sacrifice something else. And so this is usually where the most advanced tuning you know situation comes into the picture. And uh, I'm not going to cover those kind of things. And I don't think most of you would be interested in doing that level of tuning, because usually at this level you already got enough performance out of it for your application. You know, I would rather go to a vacation myself rather than you know keep tuning my code. Okay, so um, there are a few more. Yes, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> All right. So so, um, when, if, if you look into the kernel execution a little bit, you will see a, um, one of the, uh, the, the ways you can picture the execution is that um, all these, there will be multiple blocks all trying to execute in hardware. And hopefully you'll have more blocks than hardware can accommodate. And some of the blocks will be loading a bin, okay, one of the bins into the shared memory. And some of these blocks will be processing bins in the shared memory. If you have enough blocks, this is a very efficient algorithm in the sense that all the latencies are all totally hidden. Okay, so you you have always have enough blocks that are processing you know their data from the shared memory. Uh, memory coalescing, uh, it's a little bit uh, detailed, so I'm not going to give you the detail. Uh, I'm not going to talk through the slide because you should be able to tell uh, how the coalescing work at this point. So I inserted this slide just in case um, you, want to, you, know, you, you want to look at it later on. But essentially, um, we're loading all these atoms into the shared memory. And it doesn't matter who loads which atom. So you can easily design the loading in such a way that all the loads are coalesced. Okay? And this is something you, know, you will be able to do, but it's just something that you don't you, you shouldn't forget uh, uh, from your consideration. So um, in a typical use of this kind of algorithm, 
about 2.6 percent of the atoms for the small beings, you know, the, um, this is John, John, uh, John Stone's measurement, will exceed the capacity and they get kicked into the CPU. And um, uh, so it actually takes about, um, you know, 66 percent as long as uh, GPU computation. Um, so this, because the GPU is running about 20 times faster, so if you kick 5 percent of the atoms to the CPU, then they will be balanced. But this way, you will actually still have some extra amount of time for the CPU to do something else. So you're not going to be fully load down, loading down the GPU, uh, CPU. So um, this is actually a, a pretty reasonable balance. Anywhere between 2.6% and 4% is actually reasonable for this particular application. Now, um, there are a couple other things about CPU, GPU, you know, grid inter integration, because whenever you're running CPU and GPU at the same time, at some point you need to integrate data back together. So, um, you know, in this particular application, the CPU does the data integration, and uh, most of the applications would uh, use CPU to do int uh, data integration, but in, in a couple exceptions, if you really need high performance in data integration, you can uh, use uh, GPU to do the integration. And obviously, you know, uh, we, uh, there are some threat coarsening uh, tricks that you can play. And this is a particular uh, opportunity for me to mention a couple interesting tricks and uh, you probably will end up using for your applications. Remember, um, in each thread, we're going to be testing whether the atom, you know, the atoms in the, uh, in the bins are within the cutoff distance, right? And, but the cutoff distance is a sphere. And the sphere is actually quite expensive to calculate. So, um, you know, the, a very well-known trick for this kind of testing is that you actually try to calculate something that is a little bit more conservative than it should be. That is, you're going to be, you know, you're going to, you, um, you're not going to be rejecting some of the, um, some of the uh, atoms that you should reject, but you reject a good portion of the uh, atoms that you should reject. So then if, if there's a small number of atoms that kind of leak through, then you have another level of test just to, you know, to, uh, to catch those. So in most of the cases, you can reject atoms very, very quickly, okay? And that will speed up your processing. So this, this technique is you know, essentially to, to, um, to, um, to do a, what we call a cylindrical test. Rather than testing a sphere, you will test for all the, uh, uh, you know, all the um, uh, lattice points in the same y dimension. You just calculate a, a cylindrical dis uh, distance the, for, the, uh, for all the points, uh, you know, a, a cylindrical distance involving x and z coordinates. So you're only using two of them to calculate. And you can use that for multiple uh, grid points that have the same y coordinates. And so this is the reason why, for thread coarsening, we actually use the y dimension for the uh, thread coarsening, so that we can use the cylindrical test to screen away most of the atoms. And meanwhile, it also gives you the co um, the coalescing effect because if, if all the threads are using are uh, coarsening, uh, coarsen through the y dimension, then the neighboring threads are still processing neighboring x, uh, 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 x uh, lattice, lattice points. So this enables coalescing. It also enables fast cylindrical test on top uh, before you do the full spherical test. Okay. So this is a very interesting trick that um, if you're interested, um, you will see this in many many applications. You know, uh, uh, most people who have been doing this kind of test all know that you can, you know, do a quick test first and then refine it later. So uh, this is the uh, the uh, the inner loop that uh, you know summarizes what I just said. So uh, if it's an uh, empty atom bin uh, entry is encountered, then you're done. But then uh, if there are still atoms in the bin, then you do a cylindrical test first involving only the x and z, um, you know, the dimensions. And if you can reject it, then, you, then you're done with this atom. But if you cannot reject it, then you go down and test the full cutoff distance. And this is where you actually say, well, if it really passed the test, 
then you do the, uh, the, the contribution. So since we are talking about only 34% efficiency, this test is going to fail almost half of the time. Okay? That's why this kind of test is used so often in output-oriented programming. Okay? That's why I thought it was worthwhile um, you know, what, uh, talking about it. So with all that effort, you have a kernel that operates in the, um, in the small kernel re, uh, uh, regime here. And um, uh, with, the, uh, you know, uh, with this particular kind of implementation, um, you can have CPU, GPU overlap. You know, remember those uh, excess overflow um, atoms go, go to the CPU. And um, you can actually execute this piece of code with about uh, somewhere between 12 and 21 times faster than the CPU core. And that's pretty much you know, what I want to say about fixed capacity binning. And we, we talk about large bin, and we talk about small bin design. You know, if you are interested in you know, more of this, there are actually quite a few papers about this kind of stuff. So I can easily put together some references for you. Okay, So that's this. And then uh, we are going to move on to the, um, to the final lecture. Four fingers. Ah, right here. And lecture six. Okay. Okay. So um, now we're uh, we're going to uh, move into the final part. That is, I would like to give you a little bit of taste about how people deal with very large but sparse data. Okay. And um, data distribution is one of, the, uh, one, one of the, the very fundamental issues that all the parallel computing people need to deal with. Whenever the data is very sparse and non-uniformly distributed, it always causes problems with flow balancing and so on. So I'm going to give you a very high level uh, view of how people deal with sparse data in the GPU computing world. Okay? And uh, I'm going to be using two examples. But those two examples are actually just one if you start to look at it carefully. So I hope to show you that at the end, uh, before the end. So we, we're, we're trying to learn the key techniques for compacting input data for reduced consumption of memory bandwidth. And so that we can, uh, by using the on-chip memory more efficiently, and also to transfer fewer bytes from the uh, DRAM to the on-chip memory. In many ways, the second one could be even more important than the first one. Sometimes you may have enough memory to hold everything you need, but by transferring some unnecessary bytes from the DRAM to the on-chip memory, you actually reduce the bandwidth uh, you know, uh, reduction that you're trying to accomplish when you use on-chip memory to start with. So also, hopefully, we can, you know, I can help you to understand the trade-offs between the input compaction and input binning regularization. Okay, there are some intrinsic trade-offs that you need to uh, you need to be aware of. So sparse data, um, you know, I don't think I need to um, to, to to convince you that um, uh, many real-world inputs are sparse and non-uniform. If you're in astronomy, you will know that um, the input data is extremely non-uniform. They are very dark part of the sky, and they're very you know a bright part of the sky, right? And um, uh, sig uh, uh, mesh models, you know, like uh, uh, finite element models and transportation networks, when uh, people deal with logistics, you know, the U.S. freeway system is extremely non-uniform, uh, you know, in terms of connectivity, right? So there are all these things, communication networks, these are all very um, sparse kind of interconnect that will translate into sparse data representation in your uh, models. So I would like to start by talking about sparse matrix first. Okay? Many of you will be dealing with sparse matrix. But even more importantly, sparse matrix is actually the foundation for understanding compaction you know, strategies in general. If you really understand all the sparse matrix uh, formats and representations, it will be very easy for you to, to understand the, the, uh, in the, uh, the other in compaction methods. Okay? So um, this, the I, I stole these slides from Michael Garland. 
Okay, so you know, uh, Michael has been giving uh, some of these uh, sparse matrix, uh, you know, uh, uh, lectures, and um, so you know, uh, I, I decided that it's much more efficient to reuse his work rather than trying to put together some slides myself. And <coughs> so, in a sparse matrix computation, the most used sparse matrix uh, computation is uh, matrix vector multiplication. And the reason why this is the case is that uh, for most of the sparse systems, in order to solve the system of linear equation, when you have a very large sparse system, the more efficient way for parallel computing is to do conjugate gradient style kind of iterative solvers. And these things tend to give you a lot better parallelism than uh, the direct solvers. And um, so whenever uh, you need to solve a large linear system, but, but uh, each equation has only a few variables, that, no, that's when you have a, a sparse system. And um, in order to do these iterative solvers, in general what you do is you're given, um, you know, you're given a, 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 a answer, uh, sort of the, um, the, uh, the value vector, you are given the system of uh, equations and you have some uh, additional constants. So when you add these together, you should be able to get the, uh, the constants on the, uh, on the right-hand side of the equations. So um, the, a procedure to do the iterative solver is by guessing what the solutions look like. So these are the variable values that you need to get to. So you get some value, and then you do the multiplication. Essentially, you're evaluating all those equations, and then see if you can get close to the right-hand side values that you're supposed to match. And if they don't match exactly, then you figure out how to change these values, do another multiplication, and try again. And certain things like conjugate gradient solvers rely on some matrix properties that you, there's a well-defined way to evolve these mat, uh, values when you take guess and guess and guess so that you can, you're guaranteed to converge. And some other matrices may not be able to converge, have guaranteed value, uh, but a lot of the the problems are formulated in such a way that they will converge. Okay, so they're conjugate positive in, if you want, well, in the, uh, in the domain case. So when you have a, uh, a matrix that is, you know, well, that is extremely sparse, how sparse it is? Well, in general, you may have thousands of uh, elements in each dimension, and then uh, you only have an order on the order of maybe tens or twenties in each row. Okay, so that's a typical sparseness. So um, then it will be very, very inefficient if you try to represent the entire matrix, in, including all the zero elements, right, in your representation. So this is a, a very obvious case where you want to do some compaction of your input so that you don't end up processing all the zero elements and represent all the zero elements. So there are a few formats that people use. And um, it took me a while to remember all the alphabets, by the way. When I, when I learned, first learned sparse matrix, I, you know, I get confused about all the acronyms all the time, okay? So, um, you know what, but it is actually worth remembering because you can map most of the compaction techniques for, your, for other data structures to these kind of schemes, okay? So the first one is CSR. Uh, CSR is easy to remember because it's, uh, it's similar to CSI, right? So, uh, you know, it's compressed sparse row, okay? It's not crime scene uh, reinvention or something, okay? <laughs> and so it's compressed sparse row uh, representation. It, uh, what that means is that it will take each row, okay? It will take each row and squeeze out all the uh, zero elements by pushing all the non-zero elements to the left. But when you do so, you need to remember where they came from. So you need to remember the column number for all the elements, right? So uh, you would naturally you would you would um, uh, expect to see three parts of that data structure. The first part is all the non-zero elements in each row, right? And the second one is a um, a indication of the original column number of each of these num uh, elements, and the third one is some kind of marker array that tells you where each row starts. Because now after the compaction, each row will have 
variable number of lengths or a variable length or a variable number of non-zero elements. So you need when you push everything together and then concatenate all the rows, you need to have a marker to tell you where each row starts in the final compacted representation. Okay? So this is exactly what we're having here. We have the non-zero data. They are represented into a single one-dimensional array, okay? compacted. And then we have the indices that t tells us which original column did these elements come from. And we also have these numbers that tell us the beginning of each every original row in your matrix. So the first, the row zero originally, uh, the original zero, uh, row zero starts at the zeros position. And then the original row one actually starts in the, the uh, row two position, but it actually has no elements. So row two also starts at the same location. So the fact that there are two equal values for two consecutive um, uh, rows means that one of the rows was completely empty right, in the representation. Okay? So if you look at this data structure, this is a CUDA kernel that process, that does um, matrix vector multiplication using the data structure. Every thread will process one original row okay, of the matrix. So as soon as you get into the kernel, you use your block index and thread index to determine the row that you're supposed to process. Okay, so it's, there's nothing uh, fancy here. And then you would, you, you would uh, go into the, um, you know, the, the row. So uh, if the row is less than the number of rows, because obviously we may actually end up having fewer, uh, more threads than the number of rows in the system. So we're testing whether uh, the thread is outside, okay? The, um, the boundary, just like the vector addition case. And then uh, if you, you're inside the range, then you will be doing a vector, a vector in the product with that, um, you know, with the, the, the vector of the multiplication. So you will take, in this case, you should be only doing the multiplication for non-zero elements, right? So you will actually calculate the beginning, you, you will go to the pointer array, and find the beginning of your row. And then you go to the pointer array to find the beginning of your next row. And you iterate from the beginning of your row until the element before the beginning of the next row, right? So then you do, you access the data from the position. And when you multiply with that vector, you need to use the original column number to select the right part of the vector to do the inner product. And once you, you do the multiplication, you can accumulate. So you will iterate. In, in this case, thread 0 will iterate through both elements of row 0. Thread 1 will iterate nothing. You will not, because the start and, row, uh, start and end will be equal to each other, so you will not iterate. And uh, row 2 will iterate um, uh, through these two. Uh, actually, it's probably three. So then um, you can you know you can just see how the execution goes. There are a few problems with CSR. Okay, this this is perfectly acceptable kernel, and it would it would run in a reasonable way, and that you know it actually uses very little uh, uh, global memory, and it's actually arguably the best compaction you can do on a sparse matrix. Everything else that we're going to be talking about will have less compaction, less effective compaction, but you give out a little bit compaction effect to get more regularity or uh, more um, you know, coalescing and so on. Okay, so you, you, you kind of go backwards. Yes, Albert. Yeah. What about sparse matrix matrix? Oh. Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, sparse matrix matrix uh, multiplication is not common um, in the literature. I think the reason is um, there are actually very few people who bother to try to formulate their problem into sparse matrix matrix multiplication. 
because if you have sparse matrix matrix multiplication, chances are you'll generate a non non sparse output matrix. So the reason why you end you you are beginning you you begin to do you know, well, uh, you chan the reason why you you end up with sparse is because you have such a large problem and it's sparse data. But if you generate a non sparse output, then it's usually way be beyond what you can represent. But there's another intuitive reason. Um, you know, remember these sparse matrices are not from vacuum. They they rep represent something, right? So a very typical representation, uh, you know, uh, situation is you have let's say a, a network, and um, all these non-zero elements represent some kind of connection, you know, some some kind of edge, and some kind of cost going through that edge. So what I'm trying to say is this: um, when you propagate any kind of flow through these networks, it's actually just a matrix vector multiplication. So it's seldom the case that you actually need to do a matrix matrix multiplication to figure out something. There's a uh, one notable exception yeah. Okay, so that will be a, a matrix matrix multiplication. And um, does it always generate sparse or gener uh, it would generate yeah, dense? Yeah, because you know what you know if something is really close to sparse because the representation of that sparse operate on a closer map. Okay, so by by the nature of the uh, the problem, you you know that it's not going to blow up into a full. Okay, yeah. So so whenever that's the case, then you can you can do it. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, you probably cannot see this, uh, you know, very well. So uh, let me kind of just go to the next one, and uh, this is actually easier to see. One of the biggest problems with CSR representation is that um, uh, the threads are going to be processing the the uh, elements in the original row, right? And these original row uh, members uh, uh, are actually laid out in consecutive locations, so you will have thread zero going down and thread one going down horizontally. So at the same time, thread zero and thread one will be accessing non-coalescible access uh, locations. So that's why the CSR mechanism, even though it's extremely effective in terms of compaction, is seldom used in high performance um, you know, uh, uh, GPU libraries. Okay. So conceptually, it's, it's nice but it's not used um, in general. So the, the most frequently used method is actually called ELL. And uh, ELL is actually um, the name of a, a, spark, a package. That, uh, so this is kind of a legacy name. Uh, it, it was the format used by that particular package. And now it's inherited into the, uh, it's called ELL pack. And the idea is actually quite simple. You know, you, when you take, let's say, a sparse uh, representation, and then you, you know what, you, you, you do the CSL kind of compaction. But before you go and concatenate all the, um, all the rows together into a single row, you actually make, uh, pat all the rows into the same size. Okay, you pat all the rows into the same size. So, if you have a small row, then you will add some dummy, uh, uh, dummy elements into the row. Okay, zero elements, in fact. Okay, so why is this? The reason is, if you if you pack these things, uh, you know, well, pack the elements into this array, now you actually have the look of a dense array. Okay, now you have a a rectangular array. Okay, rectangular matrix. And whenever you have rectangular matrix, there's something called transposition. You can easily transpose rows and columns, right? And so remember that coalescing problem? If we transpose the array, the matrix, then we can actually fix the, um, you know, the coalescing problem by re representing all the column elements in the same, right, in the adjacent locations. So these were the elements from different rows, and these are now in the sequential location. 
So um, you, you, or you can just view it as layout according to the column major, you know, you, whichever way you want to look at it, it's fine, right? So um, you know what? Well, th now the threads will all process the first uh, their first elements in consecutive locations, and then they will move on to process the elements in the second, the the, uh, the next uh, locations and next locations and so on. And you see you see that you know the uh, thread one will have all zeros, right? So, but thread one will still be processing. Okay, it will still need to process. So this is where the inefficiency comes in. You will you will have now some of the threads will be processing zero elements. Okay, but you gain a much better utilization of your memory. In this, in GPUs, this is more important, okay? The coalescing effect is much more important than the extra overhead of processing uh, zero elements. So that's why the high performance GPU libraries all use some format based on ELL, not exactly ELL for the next, for the reason that we're gonna talk about very soon. Now, here is kind of a crazy format called COO, okay? And uh, coordinate is a coordinate for format. This format essentially records all the column and the row numbers of the original one. So it, it, it maintains the same level of compaction of CSR, but it records the exact column and row numbers for every element. Okay, so remember this used to be a pointer array, right, for the CSR. The reason why you do this is that now you can actually, you know, even reorder any of these things, and you can still recover, right? You can still recover their uh, their original coordinate. Okay, and this, in general, is not exactly what you want to do as the primary representation. Okay, it, it does blow up the representation a little bit, and also it, uh, it doesn't really uh, allow you to efficiently go and, and process the rows. However, this actually gives you a very interesting overflow bucket for ELL. Okay, and this is what we're going to be talking about next, <laughs> called hybrid format. The problem with ELL is that uh, we're going to make all the rows the same length. Right? But the problem is if you have a few, a few rows that are much longer than others, then you're in trouble. And when I, whenever I teach a course like this, I always remind my students, you know, uh, when, when they were undergrad students, you know, uh, they are, you know, most of my students are probably those very annoying students who score much more uh, higher than everyone else, right? So that forced all the professor to scale, to scale the curve and then got everyone into C's, right? So, so you know what, this is exactly the same thing here, okay? So if you have a few rows that are much, much longer than others, then you force everyone else to have a large number of uh, zero elements in ELL. So instead of doing that, you will actually take those rows with large number of elements and kick out the excess number of elements from those rows in your ELL representation. So in this case, we limit the ELL representation to have up to two elements, okay? And then all those elements that get out of, uh, that are kicked out of the representation go into a COO representation. Because these elements are not, are going to be all over the place, okay? They're, they're not going to be nearly as well organized as the original one. So, Representing them using the COO allows you to, you know, you, it allows you to recover their position very, uh, very quickly, and it, it doesn't really cost you too much more compared to CSR because in CSR you will have lots and lots of those, you know, zero pointers anyway. Okay, so, so that's why this is called a hybrid format, where uh, most of the well-behaved rows are represented in ELL. And then all the rows with excess number of elements, the, the, the excess elements are going to be all put into a COO format. So this gives you, then you transpose the ELL representation, you get very high performance GPU execution, and you can actually use CPU to do the COO if you want, okay? 
because uh, you know the, the, this, these things are not going to, to be very well behaved on the C, uh, CPU. And Michael Garland's library actually does that. It will just ship these very irregular CO elements into the CPU and then use the um, you know ELL on the GPU. Okay. There are other ideas. Okay. One idea is the JDS format. Um, the Tokyo Tech folks, are you still here? Um, this is from Tokyo Tech and um, uh, uh, Satoshi uh, Matsuoka's group. And so um, the idea is this. You sort the rows according to the number of non-zero elements. Okay? So in the previous case, let's say we go back to this case. We actually will sort all the rows, okay, all the rows, uh, um, you know, according to, let's say, the number of elements they have. In sparse matrix, if you, if you do this, then um, you need to keep track of the original row numbers, right? You need to keep track of the original row numbers they come from. But it's actually not bad because remember, the whole point of you know, doing this for many applications is to do matrix vector multiplication. As long as you also reorder the, the vector part properly, you're OK. You don't need to go, go and um, you know, recover all the original uh, rows. Anyway, so this is actually very good for iterative solvers. After you, you sort it, after you sorted all the rows, then you, you have, you know, all, let's say from, from long to short, right? Long to short. And then when you, you no longer need to do a single kernel, okay? You can actually cut off from some point, and you can divide the matrix at some point and say, all the rows above me have enough, okay, have enough elements that I can allow more elements in a row for ELL. And all the elements below me have fewer, right? So I use fewer elements in my ELL. So I generate two kinds of ELL representation, right? And then I can, you know what, uh, I can launch multiple kernels. Each kernel will be efficient, okay? And this is actually the highest performance style of sparse matrix uh, implementation that we know of, okay? Then, now, if you look at some of the you know, sparse forms, you will actually see, you know, uh, see a kind of a, a, a spectrum. The most structured ones are the diagonal ones, and you, you, know, you have some very definite, um, you know, patterns. And then you can, you know, can go all the way to the totally unstructured situation where you, there's no pattern at all, okay? And um, this is Michael Garland's summary about um, you know, what, uh, what should be used. For the uh, diagonal matrix, you should just use the exact representation of the diagonal representation. And then you can have even more efficient way of handling things. I didn't go over that, OK? So then um, if, it's, if it's still mostly structured, then you can use ELL, OK? Because uh, you know, let's say if all the elements, all the rows are of the same number, Okay, the ELL is terrific for that, even though they, they may not be exactly diagonal, right? And then the compressed row format is somewhere in the middle. That is, if, if you have, you know what, more or less the same number of row, uh, elements, but, um, uh, you know, they vary a little bit, then uh, CSL, CSR is actually not bad. And once you go into you know, more variation, then you use hybrid to get rid of some of the excess ones, right? You, and then, Eventually, if there's absolutely no, no um, uh, uh, structure in your, in your sparse matrix, then you, you may as well just go to COO, okay? I'm sorry? Oh, yes, it's called CUSP, CUSP. Yeah, so you just go online and search for CUSP, and um, you know, it's, uh, uh, the co-authors are Michael Garland and uh, uh, Nathan Bell, right here. <laughs> okay, so you know uh, he, he, yeah. So you, you, uh, you're probably going to be giving them some assignments out of that, right? Okay. Oh, 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 Nathan. By the way, did I give justice to to uh, to the work? Thank you. <laughs> so, but um, uh, more detailed questions for Nathan to Nathan. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, the structured matrixes 
you know, uh, if you if you run some structure matrices, you know, the uh, diagonal kind of, uh, you know, uh, 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 this is a Laplacian three point three point stencil kind of thing, and um, it's totally structured. So the matrix representation is in exactly structured, and you will, you can expect that the diagonal representation will give you the best performance, and you have a little bit less performance for ELL, and then you have these other representations that give you lower performance. Oh, oh, it's gigaflops. Sorry. Um, in fact, uh, it's shown here. It's just that the, that projector doesn't have enough. But uh, when you look at the, the the recording, you will see. So it's gigaflops. Okay. And and you if you look at the numbers, by the way, if you look at these numbers, these are very small gigaflop numbers for a GPU, right? You know, what, six to fourteen, sixteen. The reason is these things are all bandwidth limited. And remember what I calculated for you? You know what, if you are bandwidth, totally bandwidth limited, your total number of gigaflops are limited, right? I did a calculation for you. So this is, the, this is a very good representation of that, okay? Now, for unstructured matrices, you know what, there are uh, all these uh, different applications, including QCD, okay? And um, uh, you know what, the, uh, it, the, the hybrid representation tend to be the best because it tends to regulate the amount of overhead that you need to put into the ELL representation. Meanwhile, let ELL give you the bulk of the benefit of coalescing so that you can get close to the peak memory bandwidth. You still lose some, but you know what, it's actually quite reasonable. But look at, look at the gigaflop numbers. I don't know. Uh, you know what, uh, but Nathan, no, 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 hold on. Uh, the reason why I, I, I'm so quick about saying I don't know is because uh, you know Nathan was uh, involved in generating these numbers, so it, it, that's a dinner conversation between the two of you. No, it has to be the conversation <laughs> by uh, lecture debaters. That would be that, that would be a great improvement that we can make in the next uh, version. So, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, it's automatic. Oh, uh, yes, it's automatic. Yeah. Uh, no, actually, for this library, it's not automatic. Nathan, it's not automatic for this li for your library, right? It is. Okay. Yeah. So it's one line of code. Yeah. Okay. Oh no, no, no. There's a one. There's one to the to the left. So it's about sixteen rather than six. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, there's a, a performance comparison between the uh, GPUs and CPUs just to give you some perspective. And um, even though these uh, gigaflop numbers are low, but if you compare that with uh, cell and the and the CPUs. You know, well, it, it still gives you really good performance. The reason, the whole reason here is actually GPUs just have higher DRAM bandwidth. Okay, so you're just seeing the ratio of DRAM bandwidth here. Yes, Albert. So one common thing I always hear people say that when you're comparing GPU numbers versus CPU numbers, how well tuned are your CPU numbers to get tuned? Yes. So um, in this particular case, I believe that Nathan and uh, Michael will stand up and say, yes, we have the, uh, we, we, our uh, GPU implementation is comparable to the Intel um, uh, M -M uh, MKL. That's right. right. came from Sam Williams. Uh, they wrote a paper in like a supercomputing parade or something. Mm -hmm. They had the best results yeah. at that time. So we just used the same. Yeah. yeah. So this is a, a good case. You can talk to Nathan more about that. No, it's, I think it's multi-core. Tell you, the, the, I remember last time I asked Michael this uh, same question. Uh, I would, I, it's been a while. I've been writing several stuff, but like we use MKL. Like comparing yeah. uh, Sam's results on MKL to the pretty Yeah, because I remember MKL would automatically uh, get you the multi-core execution for 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 the uh, sparse matrix. Anyway, good questions, but I do want to make sure that I uh, I I t go to the next phase and help you to link the sparse techniques into compaction, okay? 
So uh, let's go back to binning a little bit. So let's, you know, uh, let's kind of, uh, you know, assume that we have a very simple one-dimensional uh, gridding algorithm. And we have these, you know, different, um, you know, uh, 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 kind of a sparse sample. You know, uh, they are uh, they are uh, densely um, uh, distributed in the, uh, some of the uh, regions, and then much more sparsely, um, you know, uh, represented. You know, much much more sparse in uh, these other regions. So when we bin these things into bins, some of the bins will have more, and some of the bins will have fewer, and some of the bins will have none. Right. So that's where the non-uniform uh, distribution start to come into the picture. The binning technique that we talked about this morning, it was cap uniform capacity binning. And what that means is that um, we're going to provide enough uh, uniform number of locations in our storage for every bin. And if there's not enough, if there's not enough um, elements, then there will, they will be some dummy elements. So when you look at the, out, uh, the result of binning, you're going to see elements, in some, and then you're going to see some dummy elements. And at this point, you should immediately start to think about ELL. Okay? ELL represents all these rows, and if the rows don't have enough elements, you have zero, your pattern was zero, right? Here, you know that these bins, if they don't have enough atoms, you will pad them with dummy. Okay. So, uh, but this, you know, the, the representation is extremely, um, you know, regular. So you can actually play all the tricks that you play, you would play with ELL, and even more, because some of these bins are being used by multiple uh, uh, grid points. So it's actually an even better situation than the sparse matrix vector multiplication because the data now actually gets reused. So the typical approach is to load up the relevant bins. When you calculate these uh, grid points, load these things into shared memory and have all the threads that need to use the input data to, to access them from the shared memory and uh, calculate the output grids. So this is essentially what this picture is showing. <laughs> But so the um, and I, I'm giving you a little bit more uh, uh, a summary. You know what? Uh, you, you, they will collaborate to load things into shared memory, and we already kind of talked about this in the um, in the VMD case uh, this morning. <laughs> the problem with uniform binning for non-uniform distribution is that there is a large memory overhead for dummy cells. Okay. And the reduced ben uh, there's a re reduced benefit of tiling because when you load these tiles into the on-chip memory, you're spending your memory bandwidth loading <coughs> the non the dummy cells as well. <coughs> and many threads actually also sp end up spending much time on dummy sample points when they uh, process these things from the uh, shared memory. <coughs> so there's a very widely ap applicable binning technique called compact binning. And this particular technique is used for uh, to deal with non-uniform data distribution. And essentially, you will take these input points and you would sort them into bins that are compressed, just like CSR. Okay, just like CSR. So you know what? You will have the variable number of elements in each bin. And then they will be concatenated into the same, into a one-dimensional array. Okay, so when you look at this picture, you should immediately think about CSR. <coughs> okay, <coughs> how do we do this? We can actually, how, how do we take some input, okay, random input, and generate a CSR-style compressed bin output? You can use CPU to do it, and I already show you how CPU uh, works in this morning. So I'm going to show you how you can use GPU to do it. Okay, in a GPU um, uh, kernel style, what you typically will do is you will actually use input-oriented programming <coughs> for this particular case. So each thread will be in charge of some of the inputs, right? And then um, uh, you would actually uh, use atomic operation 
to generate what we call the capacity requirement for every bin. So you have a capacity array that starts at zero. And all the threads will look at the input. And whenever the input tells you that you need to go to bin zero, the thread will go and increment the capacity counter for that bin. Obviously, you need to use atomic operation for this. That's why it's not going to be very scalable. Okay, it's going to it's, it's going to have some degradation of parallel execution. But when you have large enough bins, then the threads tend to get out of each other's way because you know every, every bin will only have so many elements. So you, statistically, the contention is not going to be as bad as the columbic summation case. Okay, now. After you, you, you process this phase, you're going, to be, you, you, you're going to end up with bin capacity requirement for every bin. And some of them will be 0, some of them will be you know, uh, non-zero, right? So that's the first phase. Use atomic operation, input-oriented programming. And then you know, all the threads are processing inputs. And they go to the, the counter and then you, uh, use atomic operation to uh, increment the, uh, the capacity. And then. You use, so you end up with this capacity uh, array, okay? And you can use a parallel scan operation on the uh, capacity array to generate the starting location for all your bins. Because um, when you need, know that um, bin zero need three elements, then you know bin one will start with location three. And you know bin zero and bin one have, together have five uh, elements you know that um, the bin 2 will start with location 5, assuming that everyone starts with location 0. So this is a cumulative. Essentially, the starting location is the cumulative sum of all the previous uh, uh, bins. So this is a typical application of the prefix scan algorithm. And there is a, um, there is a group of people who actually spend a lot of time implementing good um, <coughs> Good scan uh, prefix scan algorithms, and uh, in a library called CUDPP, it's um, uh, it, uh, it it support uh, it's developed by John Owen's group uh, along with uh, Mark Harris at uh, uh, Nvidia, and so uh, this library has probably the, the most tuned and uh, well maintained C, uh, uh, prefix scan algorithms. So I would just recommend that you just use. CUDPP. In fact, some of my students used to maintain their own prefix scan, and they just got tired of uh, you know trying to compete with John's group, and so now they all use John's implementation, right? So you can generate the beginning location, and this should remind you of the pointer array of the CSR, right? So we're really just generating a CSR representation out of all the inputs. Make sense? Now. Then you can do the actual binning. Because now every, uh, you have the beginning location of every bin. And so you can just take the inputs again, all the inputs again, and then um, look at the input and say, oh, this needs to go to bin 0. And it has the beginning location. And um, then you atomically you know, increment this location and add, but uh, put the value into this. So that the next time when you have another bin 0, um, you will go to the next location. And because every bin has a, already has the beginning location, so all the bins can actually be processed in parallel. Right? So they, uh, the, the, you can enter all these things without tra trampling each other. So this is a very, very parallel uh, mode of operation here. Now, once you, you, you finish that, it becomes a very simple algorithm. You know for each to process each grid point, you know a range of bins, right? Remember, we use the offsets to, to tell you the range of bins that you need to process. So you can simply go into the beginning array and fetch the beginning, um, you know, the beginning location of the first bin and the ending location of the last bin, and then you can just load the whole thing into your shared memory. And when you load, you can easily play any trick you want in terms of the coalescing. Okay, because you, all you do is you're loading all those bytes in there, and then all the threads will access through the uh, shared memory. Okay, access the data in the, from the shared memory. 
However, there is still a problem. The problem is still load balancing. When you have certain bins that are much, much bigger than others, okay, you will still have some bins with so many elements, right, that you will end up having, you know, one of the threads to iterate much more time, many more times than others. And that gives you the control divergence. And the fundamental reason is, is load imbalance. So what you can do is you can say, I want to limit the number of elements I'm willing to put into each bin. If a bin has too many elements, I want to limit the size, okay, so that I can control that load imbalance. So this actually is done during that capacity generation phase. Remember, we have all these uh, threads that will be incrementing the capacity counter. So in your code, you'll be limiting that counter to a certain value. If the, the limit, if you hit the limit, then the element gets redirected into a uh, you know, a, a, a overflow bin. Shouldn't this remind you of COO in the hybrid, right? So that overflow bin is actually the COO, okay? Now, um, so once you, um, you set the limit on, on these bins, then uh, these bins are of roughly the same kind of, um, you know, capacity and then you can generate the beginning location just like you did before. And then um, you can just, uh, you know, you, then this becomes the EIL style computation. And actual binning, you, you know, you can either put a, a, an element into the, um, into the, uh, uh, in, into this uh, EIL style representation or some of the access ones will go into the uh, overflow bin. So I summarized this for you. Okay, you should be able to you know, re, uh, to, to tell the uh, the correspondence. So at this point, I'm done with talking about several major techniques. And for most of you, those techniques might just be enough. Okay, but I have to warn you that we know there are several other techniques that I have not talked about. If you look at this table, oops. Uh, uh, okay, if you look at this table, it sort of works. Okay, I have talked about tiling, I have talked about compaction, I have talked about binning, and I have talked about thread coarsening. I had talked about scale, uh, scatter to gather com com uh, conversion. Okay, what I have not talked about is privatization, regularization, and uh, data data layout transformation. In the second keynote, if you remember, there were some kind of discussion about the, the data transformation. Okay, and um, there there are several like. Uh, two lectures on this in the semester course. So I would like to encourage you to, uh, to listen to those lectures. And uh, privatization and regularization are usually needed if you have dynamically generated data. Things like if you are traversing a big graph and you're generating a frontier, that frontier is your dynamic data. And you need to have regularization and privatization in order to get scalability. And those things are a little bit more advanced so that's why I figured that um, you know if you really wanted to understand it, you can go to listen to those lecture, um, you know the, the lecture recordings. <clears throat> so one of the things that um, that will be interesting, you know, to some of you is that um, uh, we actually collected a few applications, and then tested these techniques on those applications. So um, I have a table here that summarizes these applications. So um, there's, a, uh, there's some gridding algorithms, and there's a stencil code, and um, uh, there's, some, uh, there's a, a, um, a uh, angular correlation code, and there is um, uh, LBM, uh, fluid dynamic code, and there is a, a dense matrix multiplication code, and there's a sparse matrix code. SPMV, and then there is actually a graph algorithm code, a, a, a breadth-first search algorithm on, on the graphs. 
So this actually is a very interesting mixture of different types of applications. And um, if you go to the Illinois website, it's called Parboil Benchmark, P-A-R-B-O-I-L. And the benchmark actually shows you several things. One, sequential implementation. One, fairly quick, basic GPU implementation. And then one implementation that incorporates all the techniques that are needed to get really high performance out of that benchmark. And if you look at the table, you will see that uh, the benchmark, the simple implementation originally would be uh, limited by certain kind of problems, memory bandwidth or uh, you know, uh, locality and so on. After the, uh, applying these techniques, then um, you would either end up with what we call the instruction throughput limitation. That means that it's executing as quickly as it can on this chip. So you already eliminated all the memory bottlenecks and so on. And this is a very, very happy ending okay, for, that, uh, for your application. Or you can still be limited by bandwidth, but at least it's much better than before. Okay? So I encourage you, to, you know, to, to, uh, to look at any of, these other, any of these applications that are similar to your own. Okay? That, that was part of the reason why we released all, these, uh, all this code. Now, I want to conclude, because uh, you know, uh, um, I, I really don't want to uh, uh, cause any further delay. So I will just use two minutes to conclude here. There are some real challenges in parallel programming. And I did not touch all the challenges. Okay? Just like I didn't touch all the techniques. Okay? I gave you some important ones. And we covered some very frequent challenge, uh, frequently faced challenges. So let me give you sort of the even bigger picture of you know, what are the the, all the challenges that at least I know of. The first one is actually really bad. There are computations with no known scalable parallel algorithms, period. Okay? That's, that, that's a very bad situation. Things like shortest path algorithm, things like the Delaney triangulation, uh, uh, triangulation, there's no known scalable algorithm. Okay? So if you want to make a fundamental contribution to computer science and work on one of these, Okay? And that's going to be really, really challenging. And you may never finish, by the way. It's not even known whether it, uh, it, will ever, it can ever be done. But that's, you're young, right? You're, you know, uh, why not? So then the second kind is the data distributions that co uh, can cause uh, catastrophic load imbalance. And there are just a lot of these data that tend to be so non-uniform distributed, like freeform graphs, you know, uh, in some of these you know, the applications, where you know what, unless you spend a lot of effort regularization, uh, regularizing the things, it just your algorithm tend to just tank. Okay, even though you have plenty of parallelism, the loading balancing aspect kills you. And uh, freeform graphs is is probably the, the worst uh, challenge in the graph algorithm community today. And then uh, the MRI spiral scan and so on. And then we go into somewhat manageable. Uh, you know, uh, uh, thesis topics, things like uh, computation that do not have data reuse, like matrix vector multiplication. You know what? These things tend to be you, um, tend, tend to be very memory uh, limited, but if you can do some d domain com partitioning, if you can actually partition your system of equations, many many applications actually can be domain partitioned. Then the matrix may become small enough that you can actually keep the matrix in the on-chip memory and when you do the conjugate gradient solver kind of things. So whenever your system can be partitioned, then you have a chance with this category. So that's when a lot of the application domain research need to come in and figure out how to domain partition your problems. Finally, there are algorithm optimizations that require expertise, like locality, regularization. In my mind, that that's where all those techniques that I have been teaching you deal with, right? And these things actually are the least of the four challenges. So what I'm teaching you now is actually the, the easiest part of those four types of challenges. But let me repeat one more thing here. It's not unique to GPU programming. These challenges are the same with any kind of parallel programming, okay? So, you know, we're all in the same boat. Let's not shoot each other, right? So 
one of the, one of the things I'd like to encourage you to do after this class is that um, you know once you learn all these techniques, the best way to improve your your skills is actually to learn from other people's experiences. Programming, parallel programming, are the same. You always benefit from looking at other people's code. You always benefit from looking at other people's approaches. So that's why I essentially threw away about three months of my life to edit the first volume of GPU computing gems. Okay, and you know you don't want to know what I had to do in order to read through all those manuscripts. So, um, you know, it's coming in January 2011, and there are 50 gems and 10 application areas. This is the listing of the applications area. So, you know, what, um, you know ray tracing, uh, uh, science, simulation, life science, st statistical modeling, and so on. But one of the most important reasons why we did this, um, you know, GPU computing gems, is we realized that people in different application domains have been solving similar problems without knowing that other people have solved some of these problems. So we, we really asked the authors to write these gems in a way that people not in their application domain will appreciate, will be able to read. Okay, so we're hoping that we're going to be able to help you to, to understand you know, some of these solutions by looking at people from other domains work. And then the GPU Computing Gems Volume 2 is coming in May, and right after I go back to Illinois, there are 58 manuscripts waiting for me to read. Okay? So I would like to thank all of you for paying attention for all the six lectures. And uh, I, you know, I, I really don't expect all of you to, to last all the six lectures, but you did, okay? And um, I also have been getting a lot of good questions and, and you know, interesting you know, feedback and so on. So this is actually you know, really, I would say, the most enjoyable part of my life. You know, when I teach these lectures and I, you know, I, I get some good questions and comments and you know, a couple corrections on my slides, and you know what, it really makes everything worthwhile. So you know, when I fly back to Illinois uh, tomorrow, you know, uh, I'm going to I'm going to be sitting in that uh, ec uh, economy class uh, seat, and uh, but I'll be thinking about all of you, and that will be make it all worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you.